rocket is the simplest example of jet propulsion. Gases expel rearward produce a reaction force which moves the rocket forward. The gas stream can be likened to a number of spheres being thrown rearward. At any instant, the force forward is equal and opposite to that applied to each sphere. A spring compressed by the sphere enables us to show what happens. The force acting forward equals the force acting rearward. When the spring is released, the bodies fly apart. By throwing the sphere backward, we have propelled the body forward. Two things were needed to achieve this. A mass and compression energy. Both these elements can be obtained with gases. Mass is provided by the gas particles. Compression energy by igniting and expanding the gas. This ignition creates an internal pressure. Pressure upward equals pressure downward. Pressure on the front wall equals pressure on the rear. If the rearward pressure is decreased by expelling the gas, the box is propelled forward. A constant stream of gas particles produces continuous propulsion. Mass thrown rearward produces a reaction force forward. This principle is common to all jet propulsion units, but it can be achieved in many different ways. Since the rocket carries its own oxygen supply, it can operate beyond the atmosphere. The ramjet operates within the Earth's atmosphere. When launched, forward movement enables it to collect and compress atmospheric air. When the desired air pressure is obtained, fuel is injected and the mixture ignited. The resulting heat causes the air to expand. The air particles are thus thrown rearward at a high velocity. This produces a forward reaction force. Remember, the ramjet cannot accelerate from rest. It must have an initial forward speed to achieve its internal air pressure. Without sufficient forward movement, thrust cannot be maintained. This problem can be overcome by mechanically compressing the air. As before, fuel is injected and the mixture ignited. Part of the energy in the gas stream can be used to drive the compressor. It is on this simple principle that the design of all turbojet engines is based. Let us now develop the working cycle of a typical turbojet engine with a single-sided compressor impeller. Air is drawn in and mechanically compressed. Fuel is injected and the mixture ignited. The exhaust gases rotate a turbine which drives the compressor the cycle is thus self-sustaining, and the engine's thrust output is fully controllable. There is only one large moving part in the whole engine. At the front end is the compressor impeller. As it rotates, air is drawn in by the blades. Greater air mass flow is obtained 
with a double entry compressor. The action of the compressor is best seen in a front view. Centrifugal force first accelerates the air to supersonic speed. It is then directed into a stationary diffuser ring. Here, the energy available in the high velocity air is converted to pressure. Elbows then direct the high pressure air to the combustion chambers. Here, an airflow pattern is created which will support combustion. Some air enters the front of the flame tube and passes through a diffuser. A further portion of the air enters through holes in the flame tube. Interaction of these two flows produces a region of low velocity which aids the burning process. Fuel is injected and the mixture ignited. A part of the remaining air insulates the flame tube from the outside air casing. The gases now give up some of their energy to turn the turbine. To operate efficiently, the turbine must extract the greatest possible energy from the gas stream. Let us see how this is achieved. The gases are first directed through the stator veins. These are airfoils, which, because of their convergent shape, accelerate the gases. blades are also convergent, so they accelerate the gases away from the blades. The rotor is thus subjected to two forces. The first is an impact force, due to the gases impinging on the blades. The second is a reaction force, caused when the gases are accelerated away from the blades. Both these forces produce rotational energy to turn the turbine. To prevent the gases escaping over the blade tips, a shroud ring is installed. The gases then continue to the exhaust unit. Its divergent shape slows the gases and helps to reduce drag. A high exit velocity is produced by converging the extreme end of the nozzle. The turbojet engine thus obtains its thrust by accelerating air rearward at a high velocity. The axial flow engine occupies less frontal area than the centrifugal flow machine. Although its operating cycle is the same, air compression is achieved in a different way. In this case, an axial flow compressor is used, which is similar in action and appearance to the turbine. In this case, the rotating blades draw in air and accelerate it. This air is forced into the stationary blades. Since the stationary blades diverge, they change velocity to pressure. Further compression is obtained by using several stages. 
Notice that the air velocity is gradually decreasing. To maintain a constant air velocity, the compression chamber converges as the air pressure increases. Whether centrifugal or axial flow, the turbojet engine functions best at high speeds and altitudes. At lower air speeds, greater aerodynamic efficiency is obtained by extending the compressor shaft through reduction gearing to drive a propeller. To extract the greatest amount of energy from the gas stream, additional stages are added to the turbine. The turboprop engine provides greater horsepower for less weight than a comparable piston engine. This permits the design of large aircraft which can operate from short runways. The turbojet engine provides excellent high-speed, high-altitude performance within the Earth's atmosphere. The rocket will operate beyond the atmosphere. To every jet engine, the basic law applies.